Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff Pascal, and um, from Madison, Georgia. And what I wanted to talk to you about tonight is kind of the things that we're doing to stand out in a consumer ortho era, a direct-to-consumer ortho era. Um, we're seeing competition like never before, and we're doing a couple of things in our practice to help us stand out, and I hope to share them with you tonight. We're doing using technology and everything that we do. Um, right now in our practice, I've got two locations. I do about 300 starts a year, um, kind of an average practice in the US. We have uh, two CBCT machines, um, four 3D scanners in the office. Um, we've got four 3D printers as well. Those are going all day long, every day. Um, you can see by our practice dynamics here, We Typically, we are my total service demographic between the two offices is about 52,000 people. Um, if you know anything about orthodontics, um, the number you look at is about one to 20,000. We have six orthodontists that compete within that area that averages out to about one to 10,000. So the odds are very much against us. And I have two general practitioners that um, do a good bit of orthodontics. Ironically, um, the general practitioner in our area that does the most orthodontics in his, in his general practice office is my number one referrer, so don't count them out. My suggestion there is to always educate them and uh, let them know you're here for them because it turns out he is a wonderful referral source for us. We typically run a, an effective overhead of somewhere around anywhere from 48 to 52, 53%. Fluctuates depending on the year and the quarter. Um, but we try to drill down to about that 51% mark on average in everything that we do. So you can be a high tech practice um, and still run a very effective overhead. And that overhead also includes um, all of our other expenses from other computer programs and everything that we use for collections like, like uh, OrthoFi. So I know a lot of people are always concerned about how much OrthoFi costs and we are able to run that within those parameters every, every year. Um, for the sake of full disclosure, um, I do a decent amount of lecturing every year, and in some way, shape, or form, I either am an investor or a, um, an active participant with product development in one of these companies on the screen. So in some way, shape, or form, you could say I have a, either a financial interest or a professional interest in any of these com companies. You can see OrthoFi is listed on there, Henry Schein Orthodontics. Another one that I just recently started working with is uh, Black Talent Security for um, for online security and also HIPAA compliance. So they're a company to watch out for in your practice as far as tech is concerned. Um, as I mentioned before, we use OrthoFi in our practice and frankly, we couldn't live without it. Um, I challenge my staff every single year on all of the things that we use for technology, um, whether we're gonna keep them or not. And uh, my office manager, every single year, she pretty much says when it comes to OrthoFi, if I get rid of it, she, uh, she's gonna leave the practice. Um, we've just grown to where we use it as a tool that we literally can't, can't live without from you know, all the mobile forms, forms before the patients even get to our office, everything is checked out. Insurance eligibility is checked. Financial, um, financial uh, eligibility is checked as well. Um, all of our pending patient management is done on that as well. And uh, then you've also got the payment slider that we use um, in, in the, the uh, TC room um, with every single patient. So it's not just a slider. There's so much more that goes on in the background. And we'll talk a little bit more as the evening goes on. Um, you know, it enables us to wear a lot of hats. And, you know, everything in addition to all the other things on the other, the other slide we talked about, one of the things that I really like is it incorporates payment processing and manages all of the delinquency and collections of our accounts. Um, I can't tell you how valuable it is to have all the delinquencies and collections managed external to the practice. It allows our internal financial coordinator to actually get very personal with patients and spend considerable time with the ones that truly need it and enables her to do the job that she's trained to do. One of the sayings I um, like to live by in the practice is if you believe that we've always done it this way, if that is kind of your orientation in life, I believe this is one of the most dangerous phrases in the English language. And um, we have a staff and a culture to where we are implementing change on a daily basis. And so I would encourage you all to kind of take a look at yourself and your staff 
And if you're oriented this way, um, we, you need to try to do something personally to change it. And if your staff's oriented this way and you can't get them to change, it may be time to ask them to get off the bus. And it's something that we do around here on a continual basis because they're not a meeting or anything that we do that, uh, that, that changes and incorporate it. And frankly, this is one of the principal reasons why is because we are using technology on a continual basis of the practice to do one thing, and that's to decrease time and braces. Um, and many of you may ask why, and the reason why is because patients think braces suck. And frankly, it's because they do suck. Um, I, you know, I say that humorously, but you know, a lot of our patients are really excited the day the braces go on, but they're even more excited the day the braces come off. And anything that we can do to decrease the amount of time in braces is something we're gonna do. The other advantage to oriented to decreasing time in braces, frankly, is that if you have that, sometimes braces do things better. As a matter of fact, just today, I had a patient come in for a new patient consult, and he was an adult, and he wanted clear aligners, but he also needed some really good expansion and, and arch form development um, as part of his treatment plan. And I was able to, to present a treatment plan to him that give me six months, eight months in braces, and we will do what braces do best and then get you into aligners to do what aligners do best. And that's exactly how he started. And that was not a plan he considered because he thought he was kind of supposed to be in braces for two years. Um, our practice mission is being committed to enhancing lives by improving smiles and bites with excellence by delivering custom orthodontic solutions in less time using the latest technologies available. And that's the orientation that our practice is taking and I hope you, and we'll kind of outline more of that as the evening goes on. Basically the, the technologies that we use on a daily basis in our practice, I kind of call them our three pillars. The first one is a sagittal first approach, and this is enabled with the motion appliance. Um, that is a Henry Schein product that we use. Um, it standardizes getting everybody to a class one cl uh, platform. So the first thing we do is all class twos and class threes, uh, we establish a class one platform. This also helps initiate resolution of initial crowding, and it, it also um, alters the plane of occlusion in those patients where it needs to be altered. And uh, I lecture a lot on sagittal first approach. We'll show a couple of examples of that tonight, but if you wanna go into it more, um, look me up or numerous people online that are, that are talking about this. The next approach is passive self-ligation. I have been practicing passive self-ligation for, gosh, about 15 years now. Um, and it basically does all the resolution of crowding in this system, corrects all of our transverse problems, which we handle second, sagittal first, transverse second, establishes arch form, and we use a lot of lighter, we use lighter force loads in this. And it also decreases negative vectors. Uh, a one, a principal vector that it decreases is the proclination of the anterior teeth that enables the, the lips to exercise the force load so that you get more transverse development instead of proclination of the lower, upper and lower anteriors. And the third thing that we bring together is digital solutions. In-house aligners, active retention, indirect bonding, virtual debonds, and diagnostic workups. And most of this we're gonna go through tonight. And so all that comes together in our practice and that's what forms kind of the three pillars that we utilize in our practice as, as far as the general technology at play. Within that is our, is our workflow. And this is kind of the typical sagittal work first workflow that we utilize. You'll notice the first thing is resolution of all class, two, class twos and class threes. And those patients get a motion appliance. Typically they're in that for about three to six months. Um, and then from there, they either go into the aligners or brackets workflow, um, either the upper or the lower on your screen, and then it goes all the way through to refinement and detail. The nice thing about this workflow is that we're able to bounce between brackets and aligners, and you can kind of see from the green section to the light blue section up on the refinement section, and then in some of those rare cases where we need to go to aligners and braces, um, we can do that and then go back into retention. Um, but this workflow is a very effective workflow that we found that we can train a lot of staff with. It's also real effective in us fitting in 99.9% .9 of our treatment plans within this workflow into the practice. The other remarkable thing about this workflow is most of our treatment times are hovering somewhere around that 14 to 16 month mark, and that's including class two and class three resolutions. Yes, we have some longer treatment plans occasionally, 
but this workflow enables us to nail these 14 to 16 month treatment plans that, that our patients want. So as most of you know, we are currently in the fourth uh, industrial revolution right now. Um, we've had three more before this, and uh, we are in the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, the major driver behind this revolution is there's just basically massive computing capacity at decreasing costs, negligible costs to our patients. A great example of that is something that every one of us carries around in our hand every day. We're carrying around more computing power in our phones, in our cell phones that we carry every single day than what put the man, first man on the moon. So, you know, computing power is vastly decreasing and in cost. That computing power that put men that put the first men on the moon was millions of dollars. And now you're carrying it around your in your hand for basically what is a thousand dollars. Not negligible, but a lot less than what it used to be. Another thing that's changed from 10 years ago is this is where we all used to go to get stuff. Basically, you'd go to a physical store, whether it be Target, Walmart, or some department store to basically pick up items. But today, everybody on our phone has either Amazon or Alibaba. If you're in the US or in Europe, it's Amazon. If you're in Asia, it's Alibaba. And you pretty much buy anything you want and can have it to your door within a day or two days. And if you're like me that lives out in the sticks, it's two days. You can even get retainers today online in Amazon. This slide is probably about two years old now, and they'll send you an at-home kit. You'll get your impression and then send it in and you'll get a retainer made. Lord knows where the retainer is made. It could be India, it could be Asia, it could be Texas, who knows? But you know, you can get a retainer today on Amazon. And as everybody this knows, is a lighter. sorry well, about that clear, sound in the back, hold on. From small. we'll mute that. So today you can get Smile Direct Club online. And a lot of us look at this as major competition. It is definitely disrupting the entire industry. They're uh, on course, from what I understand, to make a billion dollars or more this year. They're making over, a, 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 what is that, $100 million a month. I mean, it's pretty remarkable how much this company is making, and they're scheduled to grow by 10 times this year from last year. So this is a pretty remarkable um, new way of distributing care to people. You can argue with uh, the marketing behind it. You can argue with the results. Um, but they're successfully implementing this plan. Heck, even uh, just last month, we saw this ad promo for nighttime clear aligners. And for years, we've been castigating patients on, you know, where those aligners and, and you've got to be at that 22 hours a day. Well, what Smile Direct Club do? They flipped it. They realized that not all of their patients are going to wear them for 22 hours a day. So Instead of telling your patients that they're doing something negative and trying to, you know, basically kick them and get them to do, wear them more, they turned around and said, well, heck, we'll just market directly to those patients. And they're saying, you don't want to wear aligners 22 hours a day? Well, then wear them, you know, 10 hours a day and just wear them twice as long. Um, that may not be the most effective way to do it, but boy, I got to tell you, I have to admire their tenacity and the way they're marketing because all they're doing is marketing to what patients are doing and we're just putting them down for it. So kind of take that in consideration. They're marketing everywhere. And uh, one of the biggest, you know, that you see this, this one ad was put up in uh, Chicago. I don't have the money to put up an ad like that. I don't, I doubt many of you online tonight have an ad to put money up like that, but that's pretty fresh and remarkable. And then look at the bus. This bus was just north of me, I think about six weeks ago. And, uh, you know, you could go get scanned in that bus and get started that day in that bus. And it is currently traveling all over the United States. I'm sure they have more than one. I have no idea. But that bus is going to show up all over the place. And so expect it to be right near your practice one day. And it's not just about Smile Direct Club. Candid.com, they're making an impact. Um, I subscribe to a couple of online forums, uh, independent of orthodontics, and I've seen some marketing campaigns that they're hitting with right now. So they're gaining steam as well. So these conversations aren't gonna stop. As a matter of fact, if you look at the purple line, that is, a, these are Google trends over the last five years, and over the last three years, you've got a steady increase of Smile Direct Club, and ironically, it's getting close to equal with Clear Aligners and Invisalign as far as their campaign, so they're being very impactful. The cool thing, 
as far as trends are concerned, orthodontics and braces is currently being searched a lot more. And there's a general upswing over the last five years. And we're gonna go into some of this data. But even with all this technology, we're still manufacturing as a profession zero, zero degree brackets. Um, I know about three years ago um, in the US and North America alone, over 100,000 cases of these of zero, zero degree brackets were sold. Um, that, I cannot believe that those brackets are still being sold. I, I, I would actually say that that is probably malpractice in my opinion in this day and age. Talk about some population data and, and uh, some things that we need to be, uh, just be aware of because I think it's actually a really positive thing to think about. You take 330 million people in the United States right now, take 30 million people out of the population data and uh, just think about that there are 300 million people that are left. Invisalign says that about 74% of the population either is um, either has a desire or a need for straight teeth. And even if you chop that in half, um, it's still a significant number. And of that number, how many are we treating every year? Three million people. That's pretty much it. That's all that we treat. About a million adults, about two million kids right now and as far as all North America is concerned. And like I said, even if you take that number, that 244 and chop it in half, that's a heck of a market space that we're not currently reaching. Now, I will tell you that that green area, that market space, this is what all the direct-to-consumer companies are going after they really could care less about this. And so what I'm hoping over time and what we're starting to see in our practice, because this year we're having another best year ever, is this number is being increased because of all the awareness. I really think that what, what's happening is the threshold of awareness for straight teeth and smiles is actually being lowered right now in our population, but time is gonna tell. As far as other trends are concerned, I got a hold of some data from uh, multiple companies this year. And basically right now, you've got everybody is um, overwhelmingly, they're preferring clear aligners for braces. We hear and see this in our own practices, but this is just confirming it from another source. From 2017 to 18, um, orthodontic sales in North America overall were flat as far as brackets were concerned. They had zero growth in the whole world. They had zero growth as far as distributing brackets. However, Clear aligners were up 25%. Um, and, and uh, or excuse me, clear aligners make up 25% of the case starts, sorry. And or the traditional orthodontics is 75%. But when you look at the total market for, uh, for orthodontics, it was up by 10% globally and in North America and Europe. However, what was that growth comprised of? It was 100% clear aligners. Um, you had 21% growth, growth for full treatment in North America, 32% in Europe. Direct-to-consumer had 10%. You can expect this number to be up by a lot more this year because they're expected to do about a billion dollars in business this year for direct-to-consumer. And as far as the market segments are expected to grow over the next year, over the next 10 years, um, on average, they're going to grow about 5.8% per year for traditional orthodontics, and aligners are expect, expected to grow about 10% per year. So overall, our market is looking up. We just have to find uh, other technological ways to deliver care. Over the next 10 years, the invisible orthodontic market share is expected to go from 58% all the way to about just under 70% of the total market by 2028. When you talk about patients and market trends, um, the motivating factors for patients, the top two, they're, the top two are a better smile and self-confidence. But look at this, number three is still dentist and doctor recommended. So there still is a lot of trust in what we do and say and deliver to our patients. Um, when you look at other motivating factors from their perspective, they really want the two biggest things are better smiles and photos and overall improved oral health. When you look at adult perspectives, I love looking at this stuff, but some of the hallmarks here is that 77% of adults think crooked teeth are unsuccessful. 
And I love this stat. Take this to your, uh, to your TCs tomorrow morning or Monday morning. 67% are never too old for orthodontic treatment. That, that, this comes up over and over again that patients are, think they're never too old. Matter of fact, my patients in my small town, I've got a patient that's 83 years old right now. And the bulk of our orthodontics are over, our adult orthodontics are over 50. Um, additional surveys, 58% more likely to get a job, 45% more likely, or excuse me, more likely to get a job, 58% more likely to be seen to be successful. 87% would forego something for a year in order to have a nice smile. This is one of those stat points that our direct-to-consumer friends are taking advantage of right now. Adolescence, a journal, a, a European journal study that was done in January of this year, they did interviews with multiple ad adolescents, and they were like adult, uh, adolescent perspectives. I start smiling more with my teeth because I, I, when I take photos, I smile all the time with them, and they're talking about straight teeth here after they get their treatment done. The best thing is more self-confidence. So even in our, in our younger adults, they're seeing and feeling the same thing, and that's their motivating factors. I'm going to skip over this for time as far as the story is concerned, but the bottom line here is we need to stop adapting our patient needs to one technology. We need to stop thinking linear about technology. What we need to start doing is thinking about multiple technologies and delivering those to patients' needs and helping them satisfy their patients' need, the patients' needs and desires. And notice I put desires in here because desires now are the motivating factors for our patients. And if we don't deliver what they're desiring, they will find it somewhere else now more than ever. Um, the AAO does a survey every year and they highlight in this survey, they um, just ask us multiple questions and many of you have probably filled these out. One of the hallmarks that consistently comes out in the survey is that all the practices that are delivering multiple technologies to their, to their patients and to the practice environment, those are the practices that are coming out and growing. So these practices that are changing and leveraging technologies, these are the practices that are growing. And we're always focused on delivering trust and value in our practice, and as well as everybody. And the way that I'm focused on it is decreasing treatment time and making the complex more predictable. One of the things that always comes up whenever we're talking about decreasing treatment time is can patients deliver, can, can we decrease treatment time and, uh, and will they pay in conjunction with that treatment plan time? One of the things we've done is we've separated treatment time from payment time. And Using OrthoFi data, they've got over $1.5 billion in production now, over 325 practices, 350,000 starts. So what we do is we've aggregated this data and we, we take a look at it and leverage it. And I just want to run over some of these hallmarks with you. Um, for patients, affordability is much higher value than price. When you look at uh, start uh, conversion rate and you look at price of what was offered to the patients, I want you to look down here in this lower left-hand corner. Once you get below $5,300, somewhere around there as far as your starts, look at the lowest conversion rate in those practices. Each one of these dots represents a different practice. So the practices that are offering lower rates, uh, going, trying to go low to capture more patients, they're actually failing. Their conversion rates are falling. Once you get above $5,300, though, something else is affecting the conversion rate. But the thing to take from this is don't go low, just don't accept going low as a possibility of increasing your conversion rate for patients because we're just not seeing it in all this data. Another thing that we're seeing over and over again is you have to find a way to get your monthly payments within $200 for your patients. Um, and that is something that we do, we see all the time with patients manipulating the slider. They just get their patients somewhere in this $200 price point. And that's irrespective of, of what their financial risk is as a patient. And that's checked in the background before they come in. The reason for that is 57% of all Americans can't cover an unexpected, an unexpected expense um, over $500. You're not just competing with the patient, the, the, the doctor next door or the dentist next door. What you're competing with is the car that breaks down tomorrow or the child that breaks their arm on the playground you know a week from now 
And so as a result, you're not just competing with just some other medical expense. We separated payment time and treatment time. And this is one of the things that enabled us to do it. We started looking at all this data from all these practices and we realized that the bulk of our defaults is happening during the first 10 to 20% of, of treatment time. So this graph, all the blue area is when we have them in treatment. The red area is after treatment. So we'll allow patients to go out 36 months on their, on their treatment time and they pay us out. The ones that don't, they're going to stop paying us um, somewhere in the beginning of treatment or most likely during treatment. And something to consider is that um, even though 95% of the defaults happen during treatment time, if you average it out, we're still collecting per default an average of about $2,400 of patients, and that almost meets our overhead. So I no longer think about default rate with an individual patient. I'd look at it on the basis of my whole practice, and that's what's enabled us to separate payment time from treatment time. Um, in, in addition to that, one of the reasons why we have a lower default rate is because of all the work that OrthoFi is doing for us in the background and reaching out and contacting these patients and maintaining that these patients stay on their payment plans and they let us know when they're not and all that's happening in the background without our staff being involved. Another thing to consider when you're talking about uh, uh, treatment plans with patients is same day starts. And the reason why is the demand curve falls as soon as the patients leave your door. Um, look at this at 45 days out, your demand curve falls from set from basically if the, you have a 70, 70% to 80% start rate in your practice, it's falling all the way down to 20 to 30% chance that you're going to start those patients. So 75 to 80% drop within 45 days after they walk out of your office. Why is that? Either they went somewhere else or something else took that $500 a month and, and they had to shift priorities. So we've developed a same day start culture in our practice. Everything is oriented towards getting that patient started from the initial phone call all the way through the consultation. And the practices that do have, have higher same day starts obviously have a higher what we call TRC or treatment recommended conversion rate. So basically higher same day starts, higher conversion rate overall. So the conclusion from this segment is decrease treatment times as much as you can. Monthly, pri monthly affordability is a higher priority than price. Offer plans that are $200 a month le or, or less. Develop that same day start in your, in your practice culture and then separate payment time for treatment time. Now I wanna jump ahead a little bit. And what I wanna talk to you about now is um, how we're doing all that in our practice with aligners and brackets. What started me down this path was, if you look on the left-hand side of, the, of this chart, think of the whole screen as the x-axis is in patient inconvenience, more at the top, less at the bottom. Practice difficulty is across, is a, is across the bottom of the, pra, of, the, of, the, of the screen. Now brackets, bands and brackets, all we, was all we had for many, many years, and if a patient didn't want to do those, they didn't really have an option. Then along came aligners. Typically, they're much more convenient to our patients, but they still have to come into our practice. Now we have to compete with direct-to-consumer aligners. So one of the things that we started doing in our practice is developing a philosophy that we can go in and out of our aligners and our brackets. So everything we're doing right now with aligners is oriented towards delivering this to our patients. And like I said earlier, we're delivering it through sagittal first, passive self-ligation and digital solutions. So I wanna start talking a little bit more detail on digital solutions and keep in mind that we still work within this, this sagittal first workflow. Uh, patient real quick, just wanna kind of show you what we do on a routine basis. Got a class two case, unilateral class two. She wants uh, aligners. You know, I don't like doing serial distalization. It just takes too long and you know, it seems like it takes forever with 60, 80 aligners. So what we do in our practice is we start doing the motion appliance right off the bat, deliver the motion appliance. She comes in, this is her correction after just one month on the right hand side, starting to overcorrect on the left. She comes in after two months, 
this canine's pretty mobile, getting a little extruded. So I jump it to, uh, uh, I take that off and um, we go to the uh, upper six to four and we finish her out, her class two resolution that way. After five months, here she is. She's overcorrected adequately. And there she is on her profile after five months. So then we start scanning for our aligners and then we treat her out in aligners. And I'm just gonna quickly go through because I know everybody's time is precious. We scan her for refinement. And here she is all fixed, all finished up, six months in motion, nine months in aligners, and we're done. And that, that was using Invisalign, and now we're doing all that in-house. But that's just a, a real good example of the sagittal, work for, it's a sagittal uh, um, first workflow with clear aligners. And there she is before and after. So not bad resolution in, in uh, nine months of aligners. So how are we delivering this in-house now? So I wanna kind of go over my treatment philosophy with our workflows and why, it's a, why we've had it have a little bit different um, from our traditional workflows with Invisalign or some other external aligner manufacturer. So traditionally you would think about um, scanning a patient, delivering aligners, aligner zero to aligner whatever X, and then eventually you take it to the end of the, whatever series, and then you would rescan for a refinement and go to the beginning. Yes, you can stop in the middle and do a reboot or whatever you want to call it, but the vast majority of the emphasis is going all the way to the end. And you would do multiple refinements and then eventually get to a retainer. Well, the way we do it now is we take advantage of the fact that we don't have to go all the way to the end. And I'm gonna go over this in a little bit of a detail. So I go, I do my aligners and we manufacture, say, say we design 18 aligners or 24 aligners. And we come in and say after the patient's been in 12 aligners, things aren't tracking as well. Well, now because I don't manufacture the remaining 12, we think nothing of rescanning a patient and getting him back into a liner. And because we're doing them in-house, this time between delivering aligners is also contracted to just a week or two. And then we get them back on track and get them and get them going again. And since we're separating payment time from treatment time because of leveraging OrthoFi and the conveniences therein, we're also I also don't even think about how fast I'm getting the patients done anymore because we're separating those two concepts. And so we, we treat this all the way through and at any given time I'm doing a new scan and that improves accuracies. And I'll actually show you some slides in regards to that a little bit, a little bit later. So now my philosophy is at any given time that the patient comes in, we can do a new scan and get them back on track and get them going and also deliver those next series of aligners very efficiently and quickly. So as far as designing in-house aligners, this is sort of down to the, to the workflow of delivering aligners. What we do is we design, say in this hypothetical case, one through 15 aligners. What I'm doing is I'm manufacturing one through six. We deliver one through five, and then we get them back. Typically, I'm either using a one-week or a 10-day protocol, depending on how much movement I'm, I put into the in-house aligners. Then we, deliver, we get them back and we deliver the sixth aligner. If they're tracking, we'll deliver it. If they're not tracking, then we just rescan them just like I showed you in the previous chart. And then we reset the design and uh, on the uh, actual workflow and then deliver new aligners. But if they're tracking, we deliver the sixth aligner. Then we manufacture six more aligners. Then the patient either comes by the office and they just pick up from the front desk the next five aligners, or they turn around and we, and we can mail them to them as well if they live further away. And then the same protocol happens here. We hold back the 12th aligner, deliver the 12th, we evaluate it uh, after the 11th. If they're still tracking, we deliver the 12th. If they're not, then we take them back and we rescan them and then we remanufacture or, or retarget the final treatment plan. And that's just how we're going about delivering in-house aligners and it's becoming very efficient 
and we're managing all of our workflows and our treatment times um, with a lot more accuracy than we used to. How are we doing this? Because we've got a full digital lab now. Um, we have a digital technician and she is in here in between patients all day, every day. Um, her, she, we, we, had, we created this a digital assistant about two years ago. Um, if you don't have a digital assistant in your office, I would recommend doing this tomorrow. Um, earmark one of your best assistants and just have them start managing your ClinChecks on your Invisalign. Even if you don't have any in-house stuff, just start getting them to manage it and get that worked into your workflow because you are going to expand it down the road. But she's currently responsible for all the digital onboarding and basically everything from analog capture to analog delivery um, and all the digital steps in between from 3D printing to initial setups to preparing all the printing and all the post printing prep. The one thing we do during the day now is we also have a virtual patient. We've st I've stopped managing patients virtually after hours. Everything happens during clinical hours or on days when we're not seeing patients during work hours. And the person responsible for keeping me on task, that's, our, that's my, digital, my, my digital technician. Um, she keeps everything going every day. She'll actually call check-in and tell me to go check in a patient, a virtual patient, um, throughout the day. And now we're actually onboarding dental monitoring and that's coming under her purview as well for checking those virtual patients. Our digital workflow in-house currently is we capture everything on our scanner. If we send it to a lab for manufacturing, which we do used to do a lot of, um, then we would, we would have it manufactured and then deliver the, the digital model delivered to us. If we needed to do something in-house, like tweak a tooth or whatever before we were gonna get sent into the lab, then we would go into our orthodontic software. Years ago, it was OrthoAnalyzer. Now our primary orthodontic software right now is U-Labs. And because of these workflows, I really don't care what software I'm using or what scanner or what lab I'm using. We can, we can pick and choose whatever and switch them out at any given time because our workflows don't change. Then from there, we'd send it to the lab if it was, gra if it was greater than a two-week turnaround for the patient, and then have them manufacturing it. Now, what we're doing is this bottom workflow pretty much 100% of the time, we go from the scanner to our orthodontic software, which is U-Labs right now. We get, that goes to our 3D printer, and then, now we do every, all of our manufacturing in-house um, that way. Um, we currently are using the uh, three-shape scanner. I've got two scanning wands, and since I have two practices, what I, what I bought, um, we actually, uh, downgraded this old scanner to our, uh, our satellite office. I bought a new Move Plus for that office and then two new Move Plus carts for my primary office, but we didn't buy new scanning wands. So what we do is we take the scanning wand, which is the most expensive part of the scanner, and go back and forth uh, between the, the four Move carts between our two offices, and it's worked out quite well. It's just another little way that you can you don't have to buy two full scanners for your office. You could buy just one wand and two move carts with, with the, and save a lot of money that way. Um, I also have two element scanners that we still use for our remaining Invisalign patients. Some of the things we've learned from in-house scanning and one of the reasons why we pay such detail to um, all, all of our reskins. Oh, I'm sorry. First thing we've learned is make sure you apply great or get great scans from your patients. Be just as critical of your scans as you used to be of your impressions. Look for those distortions, look for those holes. Even when the scanner says it can fill in a hole, if the hole looks too, if it looks green or acceptable by the scanning software, I still get my, my staff to fill in that hole. Look for those distortions, bubbles, and everything else in, the, in there that's gonna make an inaccuracy in the model. The, uh, um, I told you we were using U-Labs right now. This is just a quick video kind of showing you one of the reasons why I'm using it. It sections the teeth incredibly fast, gets us to where we're managing the model, 
um, and gets us to production um, pretty quickly. As a matter of fact, if we wanted to do same day delivery, we theoretically could on U Labs right now. Um, if you have a uh, Envision Tech scanner, which I don't, I've chosen to go a different route on my scanners and my workflows, but Envision Tech can deliver a print within 15, 15 to 20 minutes and you can deliver those aligners pretty quickly. Um, this is just basically demonstrating simple movements of teeth and how it works. One of the things I love about U Labs is as you're working through, it's automatically calculating the number of aligners you're going to need for any given workflow um, that you're setting up. Um, and it's, it's proven to be quite the nice software. Um, if anybody has any questions about that, I'd be happy to address them and uh, just get my, get my email at the end of the presentation. Um, other considerations, and one of the reasons why we're so keen on uh, doing multiple scans during treatment if necessary, if patients aren't tracking, is really this. When you take a look at models and you look at even just doing a little bit of setup on a model as you're going through on a virtual model, look at this distortion that you're already getting. On the, this is the portion that wasn't picked up on your scan. And the software is doing its best to fill it in, but this is what we get as far as distortion is concerned. You just don't get accurate readings of all the teeth as you're derotating teeth and as you're pulling all these things in. So if you're seeing a lack of tracking, if I see it clinically, I think nothing anymore of scanning and getting that patient back into better aligners and more efficient aligners. 3D printing, I've made the decision right, at least for the foreseeable future, we're sticking with the Formlabs printers, and the primary reason for that is workflow and all of the other peripherals and managing the, form, the, the scanning within the practice. There are some faster scanners out there that, that are in the similar price point. Um, if you're not into scanning, I definitely would look into them, um, but uh, this particular scanner is working for us very well in our workflows, and I love the price point for it. Um, things to consider if you're not currently scanning is it's not just about the printer. You also need to consider workflows and replaceable parts like the resin trays, the build plates, resin cartridges, how easy that flips, how easy that uh, gets, uh, is exchanged in and out. Our technicians do not touch any of um, the resin that goes in. It is a sticky mess. And we actually, uh, if you look at our um, digital room, it actually has carpeting in it. I've been to multiple digital labs. That is not typically the case with their workflows um, and some of the other printers out there because you have to handle the resin, you have to pour it in. And with, uh, with the form labs, we haven't had to do that. What a typical print looks like when it comes off the build plate, um, you can see how the resin is still there from there. One of the things I love about the Form Labs workflow is they have uh, an actual thing called a form wash, which is basically just isopropyl alcohol. And you just, this is the actual build plate that goes in. And we just take it right off the printer, put it into the form wash, drop it down, and then everything is washed so our technicians don't have to touch any of the resin with their hands. Then it goes into the form cure because you do have that air inhibited layer that has to be cured. Um, the Envision Tech doesn't because it actually uses an a, uh, a, a inert gas during printing and that's how they get around the, the air inhibited layer. But that's just one other thing that, that that printer has to use. All of our fabrication is currently being done on the Biostar. Any positive pressure machine will give you a really good result. I don't uh, recommend the old vacuform machines for this. Invest in getting a Biostar or some other positive pressure machine. And on any given day, this is what our lab looks like now. Multiple aligners being produced. I think we're currently at about 100 aligners a week in our, in our small practice. And I only do about 300 starts a year in our practice. And we now have three printers. Um, this is the new Form 3. And uh, it's a little slower than the Form 2s, actually. But the reason for that is because of their peel technology. And I think it's because they want to be able to, pr to print thinner material because they're anticipating us being able to print uh, aligners directly on the printers because that's the next step. And some of these older printers, the way that they would pull the, the, uh, the appliances off the printers, it wouldn't work the way that this pulls off on all the traditional um, SLA print printers. 
So that's our workflow. And uh, what I want to focus on for the remainder is how we're doing uh, from brackets to aligners. And this is a quick case that we did um, a few years back, but she came in um, uh, basically just to, for brackets, ectopic erupting canine. She had some uh, crossbite in the back, uh, pretty moderate crowding. Took a look at her, but she had some iatrogenic root resort or some just uh, undiagnosed root resorption, and uh, had no previous orthodontic treatment. But they, the mom and mom and patient wasn't even aware of it. So I had a discussion with them about getting them out of a liner or out of braces as quick as possible. So we use braces for what braces are good for, and then we use aligners for what aligners are, are good for. So do all of her initial leveling and aligning and passive self ligation. Get her in her 2020 arch wires, move her into her 1925s. Start solving the crossbite with a button. Take a Panex repo, check her roots, no additional root resorption, eight and a half months of treatment. And then we move her into aligners and we finish her up. Um, I ended, when we were looking at this on the scan, we realized we didn't pull the canine down enough. So I put an attachment on the canine just to super her up a little bit more put that in and there she was all finished up after only eight and a half months in braces. And uh, she was ecstatic and no additional root resorption. This is the case that kind of cued me in that in office printing and handling it that way was the way to go for our future. Cause this case is probably about three years old now. And along this, this progression, we've sort of stumbled on once we started having these uh, direct to consumer um, discussions with patients, we discovered on a tiered pricing system that we've now gone on to. Um, traditionally, all of our pricing was done uh, with a full treatment perspective. And whether it was going to be a lower price or a higher price was really all pay just based on case complexity. So what we're doing now is we've developed a tier system to where we've got uh, two tiers where it's full treatment, and then full treatment with aftercare. Now the aftercare was something that we were delivering to patients that a lot of people are using, you know, like, you know, guaranteed uh, retainers, retainers for a lifetime programs, things like that. We used to upcharge for it somewhere around that $800 level. I used to give them away for free if they needed new retainers. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but we would go, we went, ended up going to $20 for a retainer, even with the, the, uh, um, the retainer for life program, but we didn't get a whole lot of penetration on selling it. So with the direct to consumer discussion, we had to develop something to start to meet those needs. So we started coming up with what we call a refresh program. But now within that program, we do mild treatment at, three, at, at this tier. And now we have three different tiers of our pricing. We no longer really consider case complexity in our pricing programs. So now we have price one, price two, price three. In our practice, the rough pricing on that is around that $3,300 mark for anything under 20 aligners um, with, with minimal attachments and minimal IPR. Don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but everything is emphasized to be doctor guided. Full treatment is what we're all currently doing. That's the second tier. And then the third tier was, the, was full treatment plus all the, ret the retainer for life program. And our um, upsell, if you will, I hate being a salesman about it, but at the end of the day, that's what it is, has that upsell has is, is converted a lot more in, uh, in, I mean, we've doubled and if not tripled in some months, the amount of, um, of re uh, guaranteed retainers that we're selling our patients, our retainer for lifetime programs. So um, let me skip ahead a little bit. Sorry about this. I know I'm running a little short on time. So now what we present to patients, every patient sees this in front of them when they're getting their consultation. They either get the refresh, which is the tier one pricing, 20 aligners. Um, if we do any aligner refinements, there's a small fee for that of $150 just for a new scan. And then we do deliver retainers to them at no extra charge under, the, under that fee program. Then we have our total care um, with bonded retainers, and we highlight what we give them um, or what, we're, what is included in the pricing. 
And then we have the elite program, which is the tier three, tier three pricing. We give them a free toothbrush with a quip toothbrush. I love that toothbrush. It's kind of a high perceived value to the patients and it works pretty well. And I'd recommend that they use it as their travel toothbrush and, uh, and, or, or their full-time electric toothbrush. We also include tooth whitening and then also our, uh, small um, guarantee program for the patients. And all that's included on the elite pricing. We've seen a um, huge increase in the elite pricing because of this tiered system. And it's really helped the practice out on the discussion between the differences between our total care and elite care versus our refresh care when we present it in this way to our patients. Then, you know, it's all about what, you know, negotiating or what that fee is going to be for the patient. And so the TC brings them around to the computer and reviews the slider with them. And it's not just about the slider, it's about the stuff behind the slider as well. And there's so much that sets the guardrails because the slider, yes, the patient can manipulate it and then go up and down, they can manipulate their monthly down payment. But in addition to that, behind the scenes, OrthoFi has got this highly driven, data-driven configuration that based on what the patient's credit tier is, is the guardrails of what is being presented to the patient. And frankly, I had no clue what this was gonna do for my practice because we didn't even understand what it meant for the practice in the very beginning. And all of this stuff is manipulated behind the scenes. So a patient has a custom generated plan for them that they can adapt to for whatever their personal needs are at that time. And as a result of the slider, one of the first things that we realized is that we would never have negotiated the payment plans, the down payments, the monthly payments to each individual patient that we were before. When we used to offer plans, all the typical plans for our practice were, we were one of those practices that was $500 down. We would split down payments, but we would try to get all of our payment plans just kind of per their, fa per their plan and then we divide it by the months after their down payment. And we, what we found is we would never really negotiate higher limits for our patients. Um, but after we onboarded OrthoFi, what we realized, we didn't realize a whole lot of gain in our practice on, um, on conversion rate from a lower down payment because we were already offering it. But what we did realize real quick was same day cash. So our same day cash within our practice went way up and our, and our paid in fulls went way up, frankly, because we were never negotiating anything above $1,000 down. And it's, it never ceases to amaze me how many patients will push that slider to the right-hand side for a higher down payment. And they'll, they'll pick something like, you know, $2,200 and $2,260. I mean, we would never pick that for a patient but they'll go ahead and negotiate that for themselves on the slider just because they know they've got a bonus coming up or taxes are coming in. So that's some same day cash is something that we realized within our practice pretty quick. The other thing that we get to do with OrthoFi is because of our payment system and where we're going, the, you know, getting them from a total to the elite care, quite honestly, sometimes is only a matter of getting them to 20 more dollars a month. And so it's, it's, giving the TC the power and the ability right in front of the patient to say, look, you know, if you were considering doing this elite care plan to help out your child or yourself with a retainer for life program and have, have more or less a retainer insurance and have that confidence in the future, many times that's only $20 extra a month for the, for the time of the treatment plan. And so you would be amazed at just having that one tool and being able to display to them that all they need to do is 20 extra dollars a month, that they, they basically say, oh my gosh, yeah, you're right. The elite program is for us. And so we wouldn't be able to do that without the power of OrthoFi and what that slider has brought to RTC in, in that room. So the last thing I wanna go over, um, I know I've run a little bit long, is how we're implementing our refresh program, which is that first tier. And right, these are just a couple of patients that I'll just kind of click through, very minor things, you know, and you look at it as a practitioner and I just didn't feel justified in, 
in telling this patient that they needed a refresh. Now she had missing lower fives, but we had our discussion about whether they wanted to keep them or not, do implants or, you know, pro, or pro, uh, 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 move the lower sixes and sevens forward with implants or anything like that. And they opted out of it. And so after they opted out of that treatment plan, she was totally in line for a refresh. So we offered it to them and that's what they went with and they were ecstatic with it. And we were able to deliver it to her with just a few aligners and complete her. And here's her initials. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and complete her. Here's another patient that we did. Just minor space on the lower anteriors. Something that a refresh would be perfect for. Here she is after two months and eight trays later. And she easily would have been a, you know, a direct to consumer patient, but we were able to have that discussion with her and mom and dad were ecstatic with it. So those are just two real simple cases on how we're delivering it. But I just wanna to emphasize to everybody that having these capabilities within your practice, having, having the capability of doing in-house aligners, leveraging that with the patients, delivering this, marrying it with OrthoFi, and everything that OrthoFi brings to the table for us, delivering a three-tiered pricing system, decreasing your treatment times, helps us you know, just increase those conversions and increase the patient happiness overall with our patients. And like I said, we're doing that all, sorry about that, we're doing that all with OrthoFi in the background working for us and not having to add additional staff members to our, to our resources and to our expenses. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And um, there's my email. If any of you have any questions that don't come up tonight, please feel free to email me at any time. I'm more than happy to help you out through whatever needs you have, whether they be digital or whether they be orthofi or something else that came up, sagittal first or anything. My, my goal is just kind of to spread the word and help everybody out as much as we can as far as getting people to orient towards digital orthodontics. So Katie, uh, I guess we'll unmute it and um, turn it over to some questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Dr. Pascal. That was awesome. Um, if anybody has any Katie? questions, please feel free to, can everybody hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. Now I can hear you. Yeah, you're good. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat function. And then Dr. Pasco, if you see those in there, um, feel free to just ask the question again out loud so everybody can hear and then share the answer. That would be awesome for us to hear. Let's see. Can I have a question? Yeah. Hey, um, when you have your, your printers, do you have that in one location and then do you just send those STL files to that location or do you have them in each location? No, I, I, we uh, keep all of our printers in one location. Um, they, uh, it just, it works more efficiently that way to keep them printing. Cause my, honestly, my satellite location, we're at, we're only there five days a month. Um, and all of our uh, non-patient days that we're oriented towards printing our aligners and getting all that stuff taken care of is all in our main facility. So we just keep it in one, in one shop and that way it goes right from our, what we call our digital lab or our dry lab and goes right to our uh, manufacturing lab for all of our aligners. Perfect, thanks. Um, the first question that I see on the chat is, uh, how do, you, how do you do the elite retainers for life? So the way that we do it is that cost is, uh, it's still around that $800 additional price point. Um, we, what we did behind the scenes was basically we just increased it to the elite care, um, our traditional costs, our total care cost with the elite cost or with, a, with that retainer for life program. Um, and then what I do is, We've got a couple of different fees. If you're really interested, I'll send you our form that we have. The two that uh, the two fees I'll go over right now is if they they get two retainers on their digital model and they all get their digital model, so they immediately get a second retainer 
that's their get out of jail free card. And then from there, they, uh, they take all that home. I don't manage any of the digital models myself. Obviously we manage the files, but not the physical models. If they lose both of those retainers and they bring the, the model in and they're part of our elite program, then what we'll do is we'll charge them $20 for just manufacturing the new retainer. Like I said earlier, we used to do that um, for free, but we, we noticed that there was a number of patients that were just basically using it as an insurance, a free insurance program, and they would, they would lose retainers all the time. So we just added a little nominal fee to kind of stop that, and it's done a good job. And patients don't think anything of it. They, they totally understand that. Um, the second way we use our elite program is we decreased our we decrease our costs for a rescan fee. So let's say they lose their retainers, they don't come back, and they want a uh, just a minor refresh. Well, now they have a decreased cost for our refresh program. Our refresh program for a patient of non record is somewhere around that thirty three hundred dollar mark. Um, for a elite care patient we will drop that down to about $1,200 and that covers their scan and any aligners that they need um, to get them back in the program. And the way I look at it is it's just a value add for them for being an elite patient and we get them in another set of aligners and get them happy again. Um, that program uh, has worked very well for our local, um, really just our local popularity and marketing. Uh, the second question I'm seeing is, uh, what are your fees for elite and full case? My full case fees are, uh, the base fee right now is somewhere around, I think the $55, $5,600 mark. If we, t if we do AP correction of any sort, that is somewhere around the $6,000 mark for teenagers. Um, and then um, if we do any of the elite care for them, I think the elite care is somewhere around that $6,850 somewhere around there. Um, adults uh, typically are around that $7,000 mark for our adult cases. Um, I justify that because our adults typically get a lot more detailed and I spend a lot more chair time with the adults on average than I do with the, with the teens. Um, third question I'm seeing here is, do you have the same success with the motion appliance in adults compared to teens? And do you use anything with adults and motion appliance uh, for more predictability? The answer is I do see the same, um, the, the same success rate with adults and teens. Sometimes with adults, it takes a little bit longer. Um, uh, and sometimes I'm, uh, on my adults, I'm having to double up on force two elastics to get the same effects. But if they are compliant, I typically see the same success rate. There are some nuances with the sagittal first approach that I'm, I would, am happy to talk to you about um, during a sagittal first lecture. But one of the biggest is um, I, every once in a while, I've, over the last three years, I've run into about four or five patients that habitually posture their jaw forward. They, they're used to a party bite and they'll still do it with the motion appliance. And since their musculature is used to that, they are not having the same effect with emotion appliance. So I have to coach them to keep their jaw position back. But that's about the only patient that are compliant that I'm not seeing a success in. All the other unsuccessful areas are patient non-compliance and we coach them on non-compliance as much as possible. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any others written down. Well, either I bored everybody to tears or uh, we answered all the questions during the presentation. So um, if it, nobody's got anything else, I will uh, be, uh, I'll log off and uh, be, just feel free to email me at any time. Thank Perfect. you, Jeff. Thank you so much, Dr. Pascal. Well, thank you all for joining us. If you have any other questions on ortho fights, please visit startmoresmiles.com and you also have Dr. Pascal's email on that last slide. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody.